and welcome. I'm Dr. Malia Jones, Editor-in-Chief of Dear Pandemic, and I'm here this morning with fellow nerdy girl, Dr. Lindsay Leininger of Dartmouth University. Dr. Leininger, how are you this morning? I'm good. How are you, Dr. Jones? I'm well. It's a beautiful day in Madison. Oh, it's beautiful here too. Um, my husband's golfing, so if anybody hears my children in the background. Terrific. I, I appreciate your grace. <laughs> Real life here, people. Real life. So today we're going to open up again, the... Malia. It's What's that? It's been a while. This it has been while. quite a while. It's been a couple months since we did any kind of live video. And um, today we're going to try something a little bit new. We are going to open up the question box and answer questions from our followers. Um, and speaking of followers, I just want to lead with a huge thank you to our followers. We have grown in a little over six months to over 31,000 followers. It has been a wild ride so far. Uh, thanks so much for being here with us. We really, really appreciate all the questions we get. Um, we care about facts a lot, and it's really heartening to me to see so many of you who also care about facts and have been following us. Um, as our following has grown, we have been kind of overwhelmed with questions. <laughs> We wish we could answer all of them. So let's dig into some of these questions. Are you ready, Lindsay? I'm ready. And I'll just add a note that, um, you know, I'm sadly, we can't answer all the questions, but we do read every single one and it really helps inform our content. So please know that your, all of your contributions are really valued. Yes, absolutely. So the first one we have, we received a number of questions over these past uh, past week or so about the Bradykinin hypothesis. We got questions from Katie in Los Angeles, Connie in California, Lisa in Richardson, Texas, and Vicki in Parma, Ohio. So there's been a lot of chatter about this molecular biology study that was recently released, which suggests a new hypothesis about exactly how COVID-19 attacks the body and also suggest some possible treatments. Have you heard about this? I have, and I think um, Dr. Jones and I wanna be really transparent about where our expertise is and isn't. So we are not immunologists or geneticists or biologists. We are population scientists. So I'm going to speak to this with a population science lens, and we're gonna put some resources in the show notes that are gonna to speak to this towards a more inside the body lens, as, as Malia likes to say. So we'll, we'll leave you with some good sources to explain the biology, but we're gonna talk about sort of how this is gonna play out in the population. Yeah. So as Malia alluded to, basically this wonderful team of researchers led by, I wanna be sure to get his name right, Daniel Jacobson, a computational biologist in Tennessee, found, looked for and found some genetic clues about why COVID-19 is such a kind of unique and bizarre disease course in our bodies. And the what, the how they did this is kind of the cool thing. So they used one of the world's biggest computers and they analyzed 2.5 billion genetic combinations to see if there were any clues in these combinations that might point to the pattern, frankly, the confusing pattern of disease symptoms that we see with COVID. And alas, they did. And in fact, you know, the lead author called it a eureka moment because he did find a clue that suggests that there's some abnormal gene expression potentially leaked to blood vessel leakage. And blood vessel leakage might be an organizing um, kind of underlying cause of a lot of what we're seeing. But there's still a lot of work to be done from this piece of bench science until it can diffuse in the broader population. So the way that I like to think about this is what's called the bench to bedside translation. It's kind of like a really nasty, gnarly, tough mutter obstacle course, right? So when you go from initial sort of promising finding on the bench to actually leading to a drug in the population, that is like a tough mutter. And very few people actually make it through that obstacle course, just like very few exploratory hypotheses make it to the end. And that's okay, that's science. And we scientists like this phrase that doing research is akin to going up blind out or up alleys to see if they're blind. We're used to, we're really used to this. 
Um, and we are, I think, passionate optimists at our core for keeping at it, right? Even though so many of our hypotheses fail. So what needs to happen for this hypothesis to make it all the way through the tough mutter? So first, more biology at the bench needs to be done. So expressive genetic differences, that's a cool clue, but it's very far from case closed. Mm -hmm. So there's some more bench work that needs to happen. Also, when you I would say in this case, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but no. it's not, we're not even to the bench yet. We're actually, this is a computational analysis and right. it's a really intriguing one, but we do like the next step is to get to the bench. Because, that's right. So we're, we're like pre-bench to bedside. So we have to get to the bench Yeah. Um, and confirm that the actual hypothesized proteins, for example, are involved in the proposed hypothesis. So there's work on the bench. There's also just always the concern that when you make 1.5 billion correlations, there's just going to be a lot of statistical flukes that come out. So we have to make sure that this is truly signal and not statistical noise. There's some hope on that front because other biologists seem to think this is a reasonable hypothesis, but nonetheless, we need to make sure that this is indeed signal and not noise. Then we have to understand how this can actually um, kind of point a lens on potential treatments. And that is another big step. And then once those potential treatments are identified, they have to be trialed. And then they might have hope in terms of making it through the tough mutter. So, you know, again, there, there is some hope on this front. I don't wanna be a Debbie Downer in the sense that there are some drugs that are already in clinical trials that might actually speak to this very hypothesized mechanism. So it's, it is good news, but again, like you can think about this as like, they made it past the first gnarly obstacle in the tough mutter and, and the rest of it remains. Is that the, like the wall? That you have yeah, to exactly. I'm thinking of like the wall, like they're a little muddied, like they're up the wall, but you know, there's yeah. no of the obstacle race left. Yeah. So what do you think are the practical implications of, of, you know, the bradykinin hypothesis has a long way to go to get across the finish line in the, in the, in the uh, scientific obstacle course. For now, what are the implications? What do we do with this hypothesis? I think the implications are twofold. I think there's a scientific implication, uh, implications, excuse me, where it gives other researchers at the bench new avenues to explore and confirm. And then I think it's also, and you know, and I apologize if this is a repeat, I'm not quite sure where our video feed cut off, but as Malia had pointed out, at least at a minimum to me when we were talking, um, there is some hope on this front because there are some currently FDA approved drugs that can be trialed for COVID um, in terms of the most tangible bedside practical real world implication. So again, you know, clinical trials take a long time um, we don't want to overpromise here, but but there are some kind of I would say green shoots in terms of of hope on the practical implication side. Yeah, absolutely. So a long way to go, but um, the good news is this could um, this does definitely suggest some um, widely available drugs that could specifically target the way COVID nineteen um, affects the body and how SARS CoV two makes us sick. So that could be really good news. All right. Should we move on to Katrina in San Francisco's? Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to read this question because Dr. Jones is going to do the answering of it. Uh, and Dr. Jones is typically our moderator extraordinaire. So it's particularly fun to uh, flip the narrative and have her be the, be the answerer. Okay. So Katrina in San Francisco wrote in a great question. A relative in Scotland tells me that their government's making policy based on the current R factor of the virus. She said that their R factor was low and that's why kids can go back to school without wearing masks in class. It is currently one. I looked up the R factor for my state, California, and apparently it's under one. So my question is, is the R factor a good guide to policy? And if so, why are we in the US not using it? Are people in Scotland crazy for sending their kids back to school maskless? Or are we crazy for being afraid of doing so here? I think we're all a little crazy at this oh point. Oh my gosh, at this point. <laughs> okay, so I think there are a number of good questions embedded here and I'm gonna try and tackle them one at a time. Um, the first one is what is 
R factor. Um, what are we actually talking about when we say the R factor? So this is um, something that in infectious disease epidemiology we refer to as the effective reproduction number or R, sometimes also known as the R value or R factor. Um, and what it means is that for a particular place and time, um, such as Scotland for the last one month, uh, how many people has each infected person given SARS-CoV-2? Two. two. <laughs> so on average, if you have one person who has COVID-19, how many people did they give it to? And R equals one is really a critical threshold because if you think about it, if R is one, then um, each infected person is gonna give it to one other person. That means they're just replacing themselves and the epidemic is not growing, it's stable, right? So that's the difference between a curve going up and a curve being flat if R is exactly equal to one and a, car a curve going down. Um, if R is less than one, then each infected person is giving it to less than one other person, and you're going to get case, the number of cases declining over time. Um, so what's important to know about the R factor is a measure of how much, it's basically a measure of the burden of disease in a community. And um, it's mathematically like another way of talking about the, um, the change in the incidence over time. And here in the US, we mostly use a different measure of the burden of disease, which is the um, one week rolling average incidence per 100,000 people for a given place or time. These are um, kind of mathematically, I mean, they're not equivalent, but they are, they could substitute for one another. And you could, you know, Scotland is using the R value. I find the incidence per 100,000 people a little more intuitive because you're talking about a real number of people. Um, rather than this sort of um, derived rate. What's important to know about the R value is that it um, can change over time. It's not fixed. Okay, so the idea that Scotland's R value is under one or is at one is not, um, is not gonna be fixed in time. So if, they, if Scotland is sending children back to school without masks on, and it turns out that some of those kids were infected with uh, SARS-CoV-2 when they went back to school and they give it to a bunch of their classmates, our value will respond. It will go back up again. And so it's not like the R value or the effective reproduction number is stable over time. And my concern, um, I, do, I do not think that we're crazy for making kids wear masks going back to school here in the United States because we have quite a bit of disease still circulating and um, transmitting within our communities and also from place to place. And especially right now, as kids are going back to school, as college kids are um, you know, moving back and forth across the country to return to university, we have a lot of potential for new outbreaks to emerge and for our R value or incidence per 100,000 people to suddenly increase. Okay, that's what we would call a spike in cases. And so one way to reduce the effective reproduction number or the number of people who are getting sick from every infected person is you know, these harm reduction strategies that we've been on and on and on about it at Dear Pandemic, like wearing a mask, um, maintaining your uh, six foot or more distance, improving the ventilation, staying outside um, and keeping the duration of exposure short. So those, uh, those strategies will reduce the effective reproduction number and it will um, also equivalently reduce the incidence per 100,000 people. Um, one more thing I wanna say about R value, there's this related measure called R naught or R zero. And that's the kind of natural R effective reproduction number for a given disease. So, um, that's the that's a estimate of how many people would be infected with SARS-CoV-2 if we did nothing, if we just all went about our lives as usual with no um, interventions whatsoever. And the the estimated um, R not value for SARS-CoV-2 is between 2.5 and 6.6. .6. So with no intervention, with no masks and social distancing, if we just kind of let the disease you know do its thing. Um, like what was happening in China before anyone identified that this was uh, um, this outbreak was going on, 
we would have every person who was infected infect between two and a half and almost seven new people. And so the disease would spread very, very quickly without any kind of intervention. May I add one thing, Malia, to sort of amplify something that you said earlier? So in my day job, I teach people how to make sense of medical data, right? And, and from that perspective, as, as, a, as a math teacher, if you will, I find that most of most people's brains do better with this new daily cases per 100,000 measure because it's on a scale that makes sense to us. Like we understand if there's one new daily case or 100 new daily cases. Whereas the R level, if you go from 1.1 to 1.3, that's the difference from like an epidemic to like your whole healthcare system is overwhelmed and incapacitated, right? So because oh, yeah. of the exponential math of this, our brains don't intuit that a change in our not from one one to one three is really serious. Our brains have an easier time intuiting that a change from a hundred new cases to a thousand new cases, you know, is a problem. So yeah. just from like a just from like a math teacher perspective, um, absolutely. I find yeah. the cases easier. That's it. You know, there's nothing wrong with using or not, and it is. It's one of the measures that Scotland has decided to use um, among several others that are that are more similar to what we're using here in the States, like the number of hospitalizations, the number of um, deaths, the hospital capacity, and so on. So let's tackle a quick one here. Um, Lindsay, yes. Sarah asks us, when Where's is the best time Do to get our shoot? Sorry? Do we know where Sarah lives? No, she didn't say. Oh, okay. Hi, Sarah. <laughs> Sarah wants to know, when is the best time to get our flu shots this year? Oh, I'm going to give this to you, Malia. You wrote oh, okay. about this in the Halloween post. I did write about this in the Halloween post. So the best time to get your flu, the very best time to get your flu shot this year is um, whenever you get it. So <laughs> it's super important to get your flu shot this year. It's always important to get your flu shot, but this year it's very important to get your flu shot because um, COVID-19 and the flu present in similar ways and um, influenza, seasonal influenza also lands people in the hospital on, um, on respirators frequently. And so we really need to preserve the hospital resources and um, avoid as much confusion as we can around who has influenza and who has COVID-19 by making sure that we have as little flu as possible this, uh, this flu season. So that said, it's just, I don't care when you get it, just get it, uh, get it now, get it in October, whatever. The clinicians in our group say the very best time to get your flu shot is in general in early October because flu usually gets, the flu season usually really gets rolling around December. And so that timing will just make sure that you're, um, you have enough time to mount immunity for this season's flu shot and then that it doesn't wane before the season has really ended. So if you have a choice early October, but you know, if you happen to be in a um, position where you can get a flu shot tomorrow, I would say go ahead and get one. All right, let's do, uh, do you think we have time for two more or one more? I say one more. Okay, let's take one more. So I wanna take this, I wanna end on this hopeful note. Um, Kat from Indy asks, what are you hopeful about in pandemic news? And I think this really speaks to how tired we all are of this flipping pandemic. <laughs> oh, preach. Us too, us too, we preach. feel you. <laughs> and I, so I'm happy to start on this one, Malia, because I wrote about crisis fatigue this week on the Facebook page. Yeah, um, please do. So it would be my treat to talk about hope because Writing about crisis fatigue, you know, I was a little bit exercising my own demons. Um, yeah, so, you know, Malia and I were back channeling about this last night, you know, about, you know, what keeps us hopeful. And, and for me, um, it's grassroots innovators. And it's really across the three B's of public health. So we've got the bench, we've got the bedside, and we've got broader society. Now, Malia and I are like broader society scientists, but as we've seen, this pandemic's being fought on all three fronts. So the grassroots innovation of the computational biologist team that came up with the Brady, I cannot say this, Brady Kynan hypothesis. Brady Kynan. Thank you. I, I looked it up. I can't, <laughs> can't talk. 
Um, so that is an example of grassroots innovation at the bench that just keeps me hopeful. There's a ton of frontline physicians who are improving our clinical protocols. Like they have been coming together, like when treating COVID patients and getting together on Twitter and Facebook and in their medical societies for clinical improvements. And they've made some, I mean, things as simple as proning, which is putting patients on their tummy instead of their back when they're having respiratory distress. One example of many clinical protocols that um, clinicians are pretty rapidly you know, improving upon. So grassroots innovators at the bedside and then grassroots innovators in broader society. And I'm gonna mention one in particular because for so many reasons, I love this. So there is a high school theater teacher in Kansas. Her name's Alicia Morris. And she started creating a database of all K through 12 school braced outbreaks. She was going back to school. She knew some other places in Georgia and Texas and Arizona were going back to school. And she just wanted to keep track of all the outbreaks in K through 12 settings to help people plan and prepare a little better. So she literally started Googling and she just started Googling news articles about outbreaks. And just with her Google and her spreadsheet, she put together a database and then volunteers helped her. And now it's grown and it's big and it's scaled and the National Education Association has taken it over and are scaling it countrywide so we can all plan and prepare better for K through 12 year. So that's how America works, right? Like innovation comes from bubbles in the grassroots and then grows up. And I think we're really just seeing that. And that's what keeps me hopeful. It's the scientists at the bench, it's the doctors at the bedside and it's the teachers like Alicia who are making big change in broader society. That's awesome. What an awesome story. Thanks for sharing that. I love it. <laughs> And she was an NPR. This was featured in NPR. So just Alicia Morris, you are awesome. <laughs> Absolutely. You're our hero for the week. What keeps you hopeful? I like that hero of the week. We should do that. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's fun. So um, Lindsay's our resident optimist and I might be our resident pessimist. So I have to think long and hard here. But, you know, I think what, so this is what I came up with. What is really giving me hope is the fact that, um, we have this amazing team of nerdy girls who have come together across so many different institutions um, and, you know, just kind of risen to the challenge of this emergent need for good public health communications. And um, it's not just us. It's actually, you know, there, there are a ton of people who have been really vocal on um, Epi Twitter about what, you know, the emerging pandemic, sharing science really rapidly and being on the front lines of communication. Um, we have a number of colleagues who also have their own Facebook pages that we really love and follow, um, including um, your local epidemiologist and others. And I just love this sort of phenomenon of scientists who used to be, um, I don't know, kind of, um, <laughs> What, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, stuck behind our desks or hiding behind our, our computer monitors, perhaps, who are now suddenly really needed in the public front and are rising to this challenge of, of becoming better communicators and um, talking directly to the public. And, you know, the public is responding. We have 31,000 followers. Um, and what I'm seeing is that people really do care about facts and about science. And that to me is very hopeful. Um, so I'm looking forward to a whole generation of young people who um, reject the kind of um, anti-science narrative that we have been seeing arise over the last 20 years or so and really engage with uh, the scientific process and the need for good science communication. You get the last word, my friend. All right, well, we're going to log off there. So thanks, everyone, for joining us. Um, and thanks for putting up with our uh, technical snafus here. And we will be back next week to answer more follower questions. So if you want to submit a question, you can do so in the question box, which is available from our About page. And I think it's pinned at the top of our Facebook page, too. And we're going to post a bunch of links at the end of this video in the comments section. So thanks for joining me, Lindsay. Have Stay a good Saturday. Stay Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.